Hello, welcome back from spring break. This week we're going to talk about mutations, uh, how they get repaired in the DNA, and in chapter 19 we're going to talk about cancer and we're going to talk about how the cell cycle is regulated, or in the case of cancer, how it becomes misregulated. So there are several different ways that you can get mutations. Um, first of all, you can get spontaneous mutations. These happen through um, just basic errors. They are going to be chemical changes in DNA that lead to mispairing during replication. It can also happen through movement of what we're going to call transposons or mo mobile elements. And they can move from one chromosomal location to another. If those move into a gene or into a regulatory region of a gene, they can disrupt that gene's function. So overall, uh, we can correct many of these errors through a protein DNA polymerase. That should be familiar to you. What it will do is it will proofread the new strands and it generally corrects the errors. Prior to this event, it's about one in maybe 100,000 base pairs gets mutated and that's a pretty high rate. After this proofreading event though, um, the overall mutation rate is actually much lower. It's only about one in maybe a billion nucleotide pairs that uh, are replicated. So in contrast to the spontaneous mutations, you can also have induced mutations, and these are usually due to some sort of agent. They can be caused by mutagens, things like radiation, organic chemicals. Um, many of these are also carcinogens. So it's just because something mutates the DNA doesn't automatically mean that it will cause cancer, um, but many of those will eventually cause cancer, and we'll talk about that a little bit later this week. So a couple of examples of these, again, things like ultraviolet radiation from the sun. This is why it's a good idea to protect your skin if you're going to be out for long periods of time. And tobacco smoke, again, reason number 512 that uh, smoking is a bad idea. So one of the ways that scientists will determine whether or not something is mutagenic, one of the first steps at least, is called the Ames test. What they will do in this experiment is uh, take bacteria and in this case, you use a bacteria strain that requires something. In this case, it's going to require histidine supplementation in order for it to grow. And one test tube would be the control, and the other you would add your suspected chemical mutagen, and then you plate it onto petri plates that lack that required histidine. Now, because this strain requires histidine, you wouldn't expect them to grow after this incubation. However, if this uh, agent that you added is, was actually a mutagen, it will mutate the DNA in that bacteria and you will see growth on this. And this is something that you can actually quantify. If you only see one or two colonies, it might be something that's not a very strong mutagen. Uh, if you see something that's going to cause a lawn of bacteria colonies, it might be something that is a much more um, mutagenic substance. Again, this is something that scientists will use as first line of testing. Before they would want to test it in animals or, or anything like that, um, it's a much easier test to do uh, and uses better for the environment, better for uh, the animals. So there are several different types of the mutations themselves. And the first is a point mutation. In a point mutation, you are changing just a single DNA nucleotide at a time. The effect on this can vary. Um, it can, you can change it from one codon to a different codon. It can make it a non-functional protein. Say you change it to a stop codon, that would make it a, a potentially non-functional uh, protein. Say it gets um, changed from one amino acid to a different amino acid, it may have reduced functionality. And if it changes it and it's a, uh, what we're going to call silent mutation, it can uh, have no effect on, the, on that protein. These base substitutions can be classified two different ways. They can be a transition and this is just where a pyrimidine will replace a pyrimidine, or a purine replaces a purine. A transversion is where a purine and pyrimidine will be interchanged. So like I just mentioned, the effects of these mutations, in a silent mutation, what's going to happen is you have one amino acid codon, uh, you're going to have one of those changes, and so you're just going to have a different three-letter code for that same amino acid. And most likely, you will never know that these types of mutations happen because the ultimate protein product for this will look identical. In a missense mutation, this uh, codon will now code for a different amino acid. The effect of this on the protein can vary. If that amino acid is, is similar in structure, 
uh, it might work okay. It might fold up similarly and have a similar function. Um, <clears throat> if it folds up and it has a completely different charge and it causes that protein to misfold, it might cause major problems and it might not have much function at all. In a nonsense mutation, what happens is an amino acid codon is changed for a stop codon and the protein gets truncated at that point. This is usually going to cause major problems. Uh, if it happens, especially early on in the protein, say it's amino acid you know, three, it can have major, major problems because you're not gonna have any protein produced. You're gonna have three amino acids produced. If it happens at say amino acid 499 out of 500 amino acids, eh, it might not cause major problems at all. But in general, it will cause major problems. So here are some examples of these. Uh, in an ATG, say it got changed, uh, excuse me, in the normal protein, this would be, in the mRNA, would be a UAC, and this would code for a tyrosine. So this would be what we would see in the normal mutation, or excuse me, in the normal protein. If that ATG was changed to an ATA, so again, we have a point mutation changing that G to an A. In this case, this would be a silent mutation, because again, it will still code for tyrosine. So we will have a normal protein at this point. If that ATG was instead changed to an ATC, this would code for a stop, and at this point this would be an incomplete protein. This would be an example of a nonsense mutation. If that ATG was changed instead to a GTG, this would code for a histidine, and in this case this would be a faulty protein. This would be an example of a missense mutation. So the locations of these mutations can vary. Somatic mutations will occur in any cell of your body except for germ cells. So except for the eggs, except for the sperm, any other cells, your, your blood cells, your brain cells, your heart cells, your kidney cells, any of your cells except for the eggs or sperm. They are not, thus they are not heritable. If you get a recessive autosomal mutation in a somatic cell of this diploid organism, it's unlikely to result in a detectable phenotype. You're going to need two copies of that to see that particular phenotype. In general, um, you need some accumulated mutations. We'll talk more about that later to see the effects of these. A germline mutation will occur in the gametes. So again, the eggs or the sperm. Thus, they can be inherited. The autosomal mutations are gonna occur within genes located on the autosomes. This is, in humans, going to be chromosome pairs number one through 22. And so these inherited mutations will be expressed in this first generation, as well as any others that happen to inherit it. The X-linked, the Y-linked mutations, they're going to occur only on the X and Y chromosomes. These X-linked recessive mutations that arise um, in the, the female may be expressed in the hemizygous male offspring. Remember, there's going to be two X chromosomes coming from the female, so it really just depends on which one she will be donating. Okay, so other types of mutations, other than the point mutation, would be a frame shift mutation. These occur usually because either one or more nucleotides are either inserted or deleted from the DNA. Now remember, these codons are read in groups of three. So if, um, and I'm just using here, this is just sentence, just to make a little more sense. Uh, the cat ate the rat. If you were to delete this initial C here, everything would need to be shifted down. It's still read in groups of three, but now it's really not making much sense at all. If instead of deleting that C, you added an extra C, everything still is going to be shifted down. It's still read in these groups of three. Also, not going to make much sense. Uh, and usually both of these types of mutations are going to cause massive problems for that particular protein. Okay, so here's another example. Uh, just to compare these two, the cat saw the dog. If you were to change one letter in these uh, single point mutations, you could say the bat saw the dog. That's eh, similar. You could maybe cause those problems, but it's similar. The cat saw the hog. Again, similar. The cat sat the dog. Similar. Um, but again, they don't really make a whole lot of sense, but it's at least a sentence. If you were to lose one, and so you have a frame, frame shift deletion, in this case, it really doesn't make any sense at all. You really just can't make any sense of this. And in a frame shift insertion, in this case, maybe you were to insert a letter here, again, everything downstream from this really doesn't make much sense. So depending on how these groups of three are now being read, 
you may now have a stop codon that was previously not being coded for, uh, and you may have a protein that just goes on and on and on because there are no stop codons that happen to come up in these shifted groups of three. You can also classify these mutations based on their phenotypic effect. So things like, are they going to lose function? Is it a loss of function mutation? Is it a gain of function mutation? Maybe they start doing something new and different. Is it give you a vis visible or morphological mutation? Is it a biochemical mutation? Maybe it affects how an individual could digest something or metabolize something. Maybe it's a behavioral mutation. Maybe it, acts, it makes someone act in a much different way. Maybe it's a regulatory mutation. Maybe it's regulating another gene, and so it can have some unforeseen effects there as well. So a lethal mutation will interrupt an essential process and will result in death. So there are various inherited biochemical disorders that can lead to this, things like Tay-Sachs, um, but it's mostly studied in organisms like bacteria. The expression of these conditional mutations will depend on the environment in which the organism finds itself. So in a temperature sensitive mutation, this gene product may function at one temperature but not another. And one way to look at this is in the temperature sensitive coat color variations in the Siamese cat and in Himalayan rabbits. A neutral mutation can occur in either a protein coding region or in any part of the genome. The vast majority of mutations are likely to occur in these portions of the genome that happen to be in between genes. They may not affect gene products, they may not affect gene expression, its effect overall is going to be neutral on the organism because it's really it's not affecting any gene products it's not affecting the regulation of these gene products and so nothing really will happen there